What's happening guys? So, the fan comments have gotten so good that I've decided to make a new segment called The Friendly Fan Comment of the Day. All right, so can't wait to hear some uh, positive feedback. I'm desperate to hear some praise and validation from you guys. Let's see what we have here. Our first fan friendly comment of the day is going to be from Hadji. I didn't know what brought me here, but here it goes. Idiot. Thank you, Haji. I didn't know what brought you here either, but thanks for spreading the positivity. So I predict that this video is probably going to get a lot of friendly comments as well. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about, from a personal finance perspective, whether joining the military or military pay is worth it. Okay, so I got a lot of requests on military jobs and joining the military, military pay, all that sort of thing, and so I decided to make a video on it. Now here's my disclaimer, all right? I'm putting this right at the beginning so that everybody hears it. First of all, I have a lot of respect for anybody who joins the military. Thank you for everything that you do. With that being said, you should not go into the military for the money, period. However, you should know what you're getting yourself into and have a good financial plan going in, and that's what this video is all about. To educate and inform you so that you can make the best possible decision for you your future. And this is a personal finance channel, so I'm going to be talking about things from a personal finance perspective. Okay, I said it right there. That's the end of the disclaimer. I know I'm still going to get a ton of friendly comments out there from the glue eaters, but oh well. By the way, guys, this is one of the toughest videos I've ever had to research. There's a ton of research that went into this. Took a ridiculous amount of time. I think I've spent about 10 hours writing the scripts for this one. Doing the research and writing the scripts for some of these videos can sometimes take like five to 10 hours. So please always make sure to gently tap the like button and if you're not a glue eater, and also to just show your appreciation for all of my hard work. So for part one, I'm basically just going to set the stage for everything else. I'm going to be talking about the differences in the different military branches. Now these are going to be generalizations, okay? I'm going to be generalizing a lot of the branches, but I think most people who watch this are going to agree with me on a lot of these things actually being true. So generally speaking, we're going to start with the Navy. You're going to get stationed either on a coast or you're going to be on a ship. Same goes with the Coast Guard. In the Navy, you're going to have a decent quality of life. It's not going to be as good as you'd get in the Air Force, and it's not going to be as bad as the Army or if you're going to be in the Marines, which, yes, I know Marines is a part of the Navy, but I'm going to do those two separately. Marine quality of life is going to be much worse than the rest of the Navy. Generally speaking, in the Navy, the barracks and the lodging facilities are going to be nicer and just overall better than in the army and the navy can be great for you if you want to travel the world because you're going to be able to go all across the world on ships now the second one i'm going to talk about is the air force now the air force is going to generally speaking have much better locations than something like the army most of them are going to be very close to big cities and places where you just have a lot more to do now obviously if you love flying airplanes all that sort of thing the air force is probably going to be the best choice for you out of all of the different branches the quality of life is probably going to be the best in the Air Force. Now I know that quality of life is highly subjective. Different people might have complete opposite ideas of what a good quality of life is going to be, but the housing is really nice in the Air Force. There's a lot of desk jobs, so you're not going to be spending nearly as much time outside. There's going to be less chances of you getting injured, less physical work. You'll also likely spend a lot more time at home and around your family than a lot of the other branches. And even if you are deployed, you're probably going to stay at an Air Force base which isn't going to be nearly as bad as some of the other bases that you would stay at in the Army or the Navy. To be honest with you, most people say that Air Force bases are very similar to just being at home. Most of the time, you're not going to be in danger zones or around a lot of action. Now, the Army is the third major one that I'm going to talk about. There are many Army base locations that are not in big cities, and not only that, but they're not even close to a big city. Many of them are out in the middle of nowhere. You will adjust to this desert they like doing this because rural locations are perfect for training people in combat situations. Quality of life is subjective, but generally speaking out of the big three, Army, Navy, Air Force, the army is going to have the worst. Army lodges, army barracks are not going to be the nicest to stay at. There's a very good chance that you're going to get deployed where the quality of life is going to be even worse. However, if you're someone who really likes camping, you really like being outside doing physical labor, it could be that the army has the best quality of life out of all of them. Some people hate desk jobs. They would rather do just about anything than sit at a desk. And so for some people, the air force is going to have the worst quality of life. This truly is subjective. So it's going to be different from person to person. Now pay across 
across the different branches is super easy and they make it that way on purpose. Although the ranks might be called something different, they're all approximately equal and they're gonna get paid exactly the same no matter which branch that you're in. I'm gonna leave some links in the description about all this stuff that I talk about, but there's a link that you can go to to figure out exactly how much you'd get paid. And it'll basically lead to this table that I'll have pop up on the screen right now. Now with that being said, there are different specialties that can get paid more. So if you know you're gonna go into the military and you know what specialty you wanna be, you absolutely know 100% that's what you're going for, you can do your research and look up the different branches to see which one gives you the best opportunities. And I'll get a little bit more into that later on in the video. Now part two of this video, now that you understand the different branches of the military, which of course there's more than that, but those are the three main ones, is going to have to do with enlisted versus officer pay. Now an excellent resource that I found while I was researching this video for anything that has to do with the military is this website called Life is a Special Operation. They also have a YouTube channel. So Chris runs this business and he was a special operations officer for over 20 years in the military. He provides valuable information on just the military in general as well as military pay and different careers that you can go into and all that sort of thing. I think he has an excellent website, awesome awesome resource. I'll make sure to link his channel down in the description. I really enjoyed watching his content while I was doing the research for this video. Now pay is going to vary greatly depending on your rank, but for most people it's going to be organized as either E1 through E9 for enlisted or O1 through O10 for officers. E1, which is the lowest rank, is going to start off making around $1,600 a month. O1, which is the lowest rank for officers, is going to start off making double that at $3,200 a month. Now for the sake of time, I won't go into warrant officers in this video even though my dad was a warrant officer I'm not going to really go into that because that makes things a lot more complicated most people go in as either officer or enlisted but if you go in as a warrant officer that is another route that you can take that's W1 through W5 now when you compare a 20-year career of an enlisted soldier versus a 20-year career of an officer as you can imagine the pay is going to be completely different now if you didn't know this after serving 20 years in the military you get access to retirement pay where you basically get paid a certain amount every single month Month, no matter what you're doing. And I'll touch on this a little bit later on in the video. So an enlisted soldier in general would make around $848,000, assuming he retired as an E8. 30 years of retirement pay would add up to around $761,000. So the total would be about $1.6 million for about 20 years of work. Officers, on the other hand, during their 20 years would make about $1.5 million, plus another $1.3 million for 30 years of retirement pay. This would add up to $2.8 million for 20 years of work. Now, this isn't counting some of the retirement benefits that I'm going to talk about later in the video. It also doesn't count the fact that most people after retiring from the military will get themselves a good civilian job. In fact, it will help you get a really good job when you retire because there's a lot of careers out there that prefer people who are veterans. So most of the time people who come out of the military either get a government job, get a normal job with a corporation, or they'll just start their own business. So they'll end up making a heck of a lot more than I'm showing in this video. But if you want a full career in the military, meaning you want to be in at least 20 years and cash is your only consideration, you're going to want to become an officer. Generally speaking, officers are going to have better quality of life and they're also going to have more autonomy. So what many people do is they enter as an enlisted person, they learn certain skills in the military that are going to lead to them getting a really good job once they get out of the military. Then after a few years, they've learned that valuable skill, they leave the military and then they get a civilian job that pays really well. So depending on the career that you go into, to, this could end up being much more profitable than becoming an officer for 20 years. So a friend of mine that I spoke to when I was doing the research for this video actually did that in the Navy. He trained in the Navy as a reactor operator on submarines and then after he got out he immediately got a civilian job making six figures a year. Another friend of mine that I talked to when I was making this video is a pharmacist and he decided to go the officer route. So like I talked about before there are special incentives that they give to people who go into the military and they become you know, a pharmacist or a doctor or some other type of career that would generally speaking pay a lot more than what you get paid in the military. This is basically to incentivize specialists to join the military. Now on top of that, a lot of them will help you pay off your student loans and there's a bunch of other programs and discounts and all kinds of different perks that you can sign up for. Now for what it's worth, I know I'm kind of comparing apples to oranges here, but my friend who's the officer tells me that he works about 40 hours a week and he has a really good quality of life. My friend that was enlisted told me 
me he would routinely do 80, 90 plus hour work weeks and the quality of life was not very good. Sometimes it was decent, but a lot of the time it wasn't very good. So again, this kind of just goes back to the specialty that you're going for as well as your just overall life goals. It's always best to have a plan and be intentional with your actions because it'll help you to make better decisions for your future. Now, I always recommend on this channel looking up different professions, like figuring out which ones you actually want to go for and then reverse engineering the process that you're going to have to take in order to get there. For instance, there are many professions in the military that will essentially pay you to learn extremely valuable skills. Then once you spend a few years doing that, you know what you're doing, you can get yourself a very good job outside of the military. So even though directly speaking, the pay in the military as an enlisted man wouldn't be that good, once you get out of the military indirectly, it will lead to you making a really good amount of money. Part three of this video is gonna be all about the allowances, entitlements, and bonuses. Now there are a ton of these. There's no way that I could go over all of them. It would be an entire video series, not just a video, but a video series of all the perks and benefits that you get from being in the military. There is a ton of them. So I'm just gonna talk about the main ones. The first one is going to be the basic allowance for subsistence, also known as BAS. So if you live in a bear or a base, all of your meals are going to be provided for you and paid for. You're not going to have to worry about that. If not, you will be entitled to BAS. BAS is basically just meant to cover the cost of food for service members. Enlisted get about $370 a month, whereas officers get around $250. The second one I'm going to talk about is BAH or basic allowance for housing. Now, no matter what in the military, you're always going to have a place to stay. If you live on the base, you'll of course be living inside of the base. That's pretty obvious. If you live Live off the base, you'll be given what's known as BAH in order to cover your costs. Now, the amount you're going to receive for BAH is going to vary quite a bit. It depends on where you live, your cost of living, uh, if you have a wife, children, all kinds of different things like that. You can figure out how much you would receive using the BAH calculator, which I will link down in the description below. It will generally be more than enough for you to pay your rent and utilities in whatever area that you live. Another one is going to be known as hardship duty pay or HDP. This is basically the extra pay that you'll earn if and when you get sent to zones outside of the United States, which are considered to be dangerous. So from my research, this is given in $50 increments, and generally speaking, it's gonna be between 50 and $150 a month. Now, another one that's similar to this is going to be known as hostile fire pay or imminent danger pay, HFP slash IDP. This one is given to those who are currently serving in live combat zones. This one's gonna be around $225 a month. Now, I already touched on this one, but if you're a medical doctor, for instance, who would normally be able to make $300,000 a year as a civilian, they're going to make sure that you get a lot higher than what you would normally get paid for your officer rank. So the military has what's known as specialty pays in order to incentivize doctors to join. Now that of course is an extreme example, but there's a lot of other examples that are not quite as extreme, but there's still quite a bit of money. Another example of this would be flight pay where they pay up to $840 a month to pilots in order to incentivize them to stay in the military. There's a ton of other examples, of course, I'll leave the link down in the description so you can check all of them out. There's going to be flying duty, parachute duty pay, demolition duty pay, thermal stress duty pay, and many, many more. Special operations is known to qualify for a lot of these types of specialty duty pay. And so if you're someone who is a career military person, a lot of the time they're going to go for a lot of these specialty duty pays in order to make more money. There are also a ton of perks when you retire from the military, and I won't mention all of them, but you're going to get access to more jobs, health insurance, cheap flights, better home loans, discounts, many, many other examples. Now, in part four, we're going to talk about the new retirement pay, which recently got changed. Traditionally, the military had a pension plan, but recently they changed it to what's known as the blended retirement system. So this is basically composed of what's known as a thrift savings plan, which is very similar to the 401k, if you guys are familiar with some of my other videos. And then the second thing is getting a check for life if you've served in the military for 20 years or more. Now, the thrift savings plan, like I said, is very similar to the 401k. They will match 5% of your entire paycheck every single month. So let's say you make $1,000 a month, they match 5%, which is $50. You put in $50 a month, they match $50. Total is going to be $100 a month going into your investment account. Now it differs from the 401k in that you can choose to invest that into a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA, which has some benefits. Now I've made videos about the difference between the 401k and the Roth IRA, but basically this thrift savings plan has a lot of the positives of both the 401k as well as the Roth IRA, so I think it's actually better than either one on its own. This is essentially free 
Gandhi. So everyone should opt into this no matter what. Now the second part is the check for life. This one is pretty simple. After 20 years, you're going to receive a check for life when you retire. It's calculated by multiplying 2% of your base pay by every year that you've served. So if you serve for 20 years, you're making $100,000 a year. When you retire, you're gonna get paid $40,000 a year for the rest of your life. If you decide to serve an extra five years, so you did 25, you'd be making $50,000 a year for the rest of your life. Now in part five, I'm going to give an example of an enlisted person and kind of what they could do. Let's say that you joined as an enlisted man and you had a plan, you wanted to learn the skills of a nuclear operator like my friend did. You do your research and you discover that the Navy is willing to train you and it's a very common career path progression once you get out of the Navy. You contact somebody who has actually done this themselves and they give you the okay, they recommend going into the Navy, they tell you exactly what you should do in order to get into the position that they are now. So you serve in the Navy for a few years as an enlisted man and you learn the trade. You don't get paid all that much of course, but you do get fed, you get free housing, and you get to travel the world. On top of this, you are gonna learn a lot of valuable lessons from serving in the military that might not directly translate to you making more money, but they'll probably indirectly translate. Things like work ethic, discipline, how to live a structured life, are all going to be very valuable in the future. Then you retire from the military, you go straight into a job where you're making six figures a year just like my friend did. You won't be getting the paycheck every single month for the rest of your life, however, you are going to be set for life. So the next one, we're gonna talk about the officer example. So let's say you decide you want to become a military man and you do wanna do it as a career, so you become an officer. You work for 20 years, just like I mentioned before, and you earn about $2.8 million for that 20 years of work. That doesn't count your basic housing allowance, which if you're really smart about it, you could actually use that to pay off a mortgage. That also doesn't count a lot of the specialty pay, which many people end up getting. If you average an extra $500 a month of specialty pay over a 20 year period, that's gonna be an extra $120,000. Now the thrift savings plan would of course fluctuate with the stock market depending on how much you make, but using a Roth IRA calculator, since that one is the most similar to the thrift savings plan in my opinion, you'd have at least $230,000 invested in your retirement account at 38 years old when you would retire. And realistically, it would probably be quite a bit more than that. That was a pretty conservative estimate. Now if you wanted to at this point, you could ride off into the sunset and retire at the age of 38, but most likely you wouldn't do that. 20 years of military service instilled a strong work work ethic, values, and taught you how to be a leader. These are all very valuable skills that will serve you for the rest of your life and you'll likely make really good money when you retire from the military. Many people who retire from the military go on to work in great careers, sometimes they're over six figures a year, and oftentimes they'll end up starting their own businesses as well. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the like button. Just a gentle tap on it is all you need to do. Subscribe, ring the notification bell, comment down below any thoughts, comments, criticisms, etc. I especially appreciate any input or feedback from people who have been in the military and they wanna give tips to other people. That's especially appreciated. I always love starting conversations in the comments section. And before you go, make sure to check out my other videos right here. I made them just for you.